Well, welcome everybody to Elevating Cannabis Businesses, Innovations in Retail and Marketing Tech. Uh, and I believe with a couple of other people on the panel, we might get a little deeper outside of retail, uh, but that's gonna be good. So we have Jack Grover of Grove Bags. We have Zach Issa of Puff Cannabis, Angelo Pai from C Cell, and Mary Turan from Terrasend. So everybody welcome, welcome them to the panel. Uh, so first I'd like everybody to just kind of go down the row and uh, give us a little bit of background on who you are and what you're responsible for at each of your companies. Hello everybody, um, my name is Zach Issa. I'm the marketing director currently at Puff Utica. What's going on, Light Sky Farms? Um, I oversee all the marketing right now, currently primarily with Puff Utica, but I've done a lot of new store activations uh, here in the cannabis space, as well as some rebrands on some higher level companies here in the States. So um, I'm just fortunate to share a stage with some great people up here and have a good conversation for you guys. Puff, 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 pass. Um, uh, my name is Jack Rover. Uh, thanks everybody. Buddy, uh, very much for coming out. Uh, really privileged to be here with these panelists. Um, uh, my role at Grow Bags, I'm the one of the co-founders. I uh, work a lot in uh, products and uh, market development. Uh, worked with some of you, some of you in the audience, see some familiar faces. Uh, so great to be back in uh, Michigan and uh, be up here. Awesome. Hi, Angela Pai, Global Chief Marketing Officer for C Cell. I started in the cannabis industry in 2019. Um, pretty California-centric, so I'm, I have to admit I'm a little new to, to Michigan, but I'm working on single brands like Papa and Barkley, and then house of brands at Canacraft, then uh, fully vertical enterprises like State House with 14 stores up and down the state of California, including six brands within its portfolio and being publicly traded. So here, coming here with the kind of fully vertical California experience looking at the opportunities here in the Midwest and looking at Michigan and it's a completely different game um, and on the technology side of things how we can be better partners to our customers under now understanding that is a total you know it's a street fight out here hello I'm Mary Turan with TerraSend I am the president of the Midwest division I am responsible for 20 retail locations three cultivation facilities, and uh, one processing center. I'm happy to be here along uh, with this whole panel of awesome company, and I uh, look forward to a really uh, enlightening conversation about the market and where the market's heading in Michigan. Thank you. And as a moderator, I'll just, hi, I'm Adam. Uh, from Dispenza Dispensary Marketing, we specialize and focus in helping hundreds of retailers uh, nationwide, worldwide, uh, with uh, dispensaries also in Canada, uh, where we specialize and focus in the digital acquisition channel. Uh, specifically, as she's saying, uh, that they're fighting in the streets. We help you fight online to make sure that not only people can find you, but also uh, convert and actually come into the store or purchase online. So let's kick it off. Uh, the general question that we all know is, what do you actually consider to be innovation within the cannabis industry? So on the retail side, um, just a little bit more about my background. I came in from corporate marketing, big box marketing, into the cannabis space about 20 months ago. And what I can tell you is, my analysis is that our industry is maturing, and it's maturing very quickly, and it's becoming more of a quote unquote professional industry where metrics are starting to be tracked more we're starting to see a lot more attribution models that are more aligned with what a cannabis model should be based on and i think that there's a lot of platforms coming to the space that are here to help in that same token it's important to note that as we mature as an industry it's really important to look at each of these platforms that seem as they are innovation but it's a lot more of doing the right things the right way as business should be done. I think that what we're seeing here in the state of Michigan is that we are starting to mature to that level where we are seeing a lot more KPIs and analytical programs, um, a lot more of these platforms, reputation management software being API'd back into POS systems. So we're really fortunate to see a lot of different um, 
in intriguing platforms that hit my inbox, but it's also important to look at that through a valuable lens of, if it's not broke, don't fix it, but continue to refine it through the innovations of technology that we have, such as AI and so on and so forth. Uh, to build off that, I, I think, um, yeah, in all uh, maturing, stabilizing markets, if we look to Colorado, for example, or uh, we look across at different markets in the, in the U.S., even Ohio yesterday, where got to ring in the first day of REC with some of our clients, and of course the POS system went down, and uh, you know all, all these things that some of us that have been uh, privileged to see some different markets have seen happen, but uh, I think what really uh, we're getting at here is, uh, unfortunately in the market, and fortunately too, because that means we're getting somewhere the rate of innovation slows and the rate of consolidation increases, the race for top line revenue uh, comes to shift among the competitive landscape for companies towards a shift for operational efficiencies and operational supremacy and true product differentiation. So um, it's, it's definitely a, a challenging time and it's an inflection point and I think we're seeing that in a lot of U.S. markets and I think we're, we're seeing that here in, in Michigan certainly and we're, we're going to see that in Ohio very soon. Um, as competition, you know, ratchets up and novelty wears off and the landscape, uh, the first mover advantage uh, moves away. I think it's, it's natural to be expected. I think that's uh, why with, within our lanes, within whatever we're, we're doing, we have to really try to be exceptional, really add value, whether we're the, uh, no offense, Angela, 800-pound gorilla of the, the um, hardware category or we're a, a niche player like cultivation packaging or you're a thought leader and, and uh, knowledge provider to expanding organizations. I, I think that's true now more, more than ever in cannabis. I think that's a really big question. You know, when we think about what is innovation, um, it's still a very nascent industry in many ways. And as, we're t as you're hearing here on the panel, is um, the industry is professionalizing. We hear a lot of terminology around CPG, general marketing, you know, how do you do retail like CVS. Um, and so the three dimensions of cheaper, faster, better, you know, we're going to be always around that kind of metric. But then what's going to be truly disruptive for our industry? And if we think about individual regions or states, they're almost like little countries, right? because each market is different, we're highly regulated. So the regulation that allows for different types of um, digital marketing um, and for compliance and packaging, uh, formulation, what you can put out there, capacity. And then from the technology side in terms of tech hardware, what are we actually creating at C-Cell that's going to disrupt the market? So are we solving for problems? Are we solving for you know, filling capping issues? Are we solving for real consumer oriented, real sensory differences in terms of you know, not having any kind of burnt taste? And then you've got no clogging. So we've got technology coming down the roadmap that's actually gonna solve for those. And I think those are true innovations because not only is it gonna be better for the customer, it's gonna be better for the consumer. And that's gonna change the way the market's gonna demand in terms of what they ask for. So you got to meet the customer where they are. When I think of innovation, I think of device innovation. Uh, things are changing rapidly. Packaging is better. Devices are better. And also automation. You know, in cultivation, seeing many different fill machines and trim machines that we didn't see when I started in 2018. And then product innovations. What we're bringing to Michigan and the variety of products we're bringing to Michigan. And Michigan's a very flower-heavy state. But we're also looking at uh, you know other markets and trying to capture and duplicate that here with our own Michigan twist. So um, inspiration's all over. We look uh, to many areas for inspiration for product. So that's uh, I'd say the main thing. And then technology, backend systems. I think somebody mentioned that as well. Um, you know allocation programs, things that we didn't have. We would do it the old-fashioned way with the spreadsheet. Now there's uh, programs to help us and get more organized and dial down so our business is more efficient. And it is about efficiency. I mean, it's a really rough market, so you have to set yourself apart in any way th that you can. You know, things we didn't look at, customer experience, customer journey, um, really making sure the guest is getting a great experience, not just coming in and grabbing your product and leaving, but getting the feedback from them and meeting them where they're at and also with what products they want and need. So that's what I see here. Yeah. it's. Uh it's been very interesting for us as well. Uh, I believe with pretty much everybody's background here coming from other industries, 
and seeing how far behind this entire market has been for a very long time uh, in innovation really just catching up to what everybody else is doing. It's been a really interesting thing to see, especially in a very restrictive market, the opportunity to just do the fundamental principles of what you need to do extremely well. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm curious to hear, especially in this restrictive market, what are you doing and what have you been focusing on to do the things that you are allowed to do extremely well? And I'm pretty sure that that's a more focused question for the omni-channel experience of actual marketing, uh, which is the hardest part of all of this. Um, so I'm curious to hear from you. Uh, with foundational effort and making sure that you're being extremely effective with what you are allowed to do, what innovative techniques have you done to build, to innovate and be on top of that to be uh, doing what you're allowed to do well? Um, I think what it comes down to originally what I just discussed earlier would be the innovation of the platforms that we have available to us. The retargeting efforts of the messaging platforms that we have in the space are, are becoming better and better daily. Um, primarily the one that I've used has made a lot of effort in the last three to six months to make a lot of updates on the back end to ensure that us as marketing directors and marketing departments are being able to really um, coordinate who we want to direct these messages to, how often they want to be there, um, the triggers that they are having in place for us. It's making our lives, as we've heard up here, a lot more streamlined. And I think that becomes um, a big thing for us as leaders of these industry um, retailers, brands, because it keeps us high level to have the ability to continue to push the business forward. So the streamlining of the innovational programs, such as the uh, targeted marketing through messaging platforms, um, we are utilizing AI very safely and hesitantly because we don't want to oversaturate our content, which is another big piece of what we're doing here, is we're leaning heavily into organic marketing and really showcasing um, any brand that I've been a part of, who they really stand to attribute as a customer. And I think that's really important for anyone um, as we look at marketing as a whole, as I, as I speak to stakeholders, um, organic marketing and, and really making sure that you're engaging with your customer um, on social media is really the best organic way to stay um, in that area of, of um, safety net, I want to say. It's hard to say that in this space, but I think what I've told our team is as long as we're engaging with our customer, it's not about the content out there. It's what they're, they're um, becoming part of our, our, our community. Um, and so that's really important. The other side of it is it's important for efficiencies as us as uh, department leaders, but it's also important to our stakeholders to understand the metrics that go behind the return on the investment into these marketing departments. So on the other side of that coin, I think it's really important to lean in and leverage all the platforms you have available to you, whether that's a QR code, like flow code platform where you can track measurables on click-throughs, um, or it's embedded in something like a loyalty program and, and you're really lining up your analytics. As I said earlier, these programs are becoming uh, a lot more dialed in um, as we progress pretty quickly. So I think it's just a combination of aligning with the communication of what is expected of your customer and also your stakeholders, and also understanding the balance of that innovation and not leaning too heavily into it, and also showcasing the organic side of things as well. Uh, can I have one follow-up question to that? Uh, one of the things that I've noticed is transparency of the data and the data actually being accurate that's being fed back to you. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on those challenges, specifically as the platforms are starting to catch up, as well as the services that have been sold to you uh, are either getting found out that that data isn't actually accurate, uh, I'm curious to just get your thoughts on uh, what you found to actually be dependable and how you are internally tracking to making sure that that data is dependable. I'm really glad you asked that because I think that's a big elephant in the room in the industry today is how trustworthy are the analytics that we're receiving as companies. Um, it takes a lens of somebody in our seat to be able to evaluate every program and that's one of the first things that I'm looking at if I am entertaining a new platform is how are you tracking and attributing your analytics and your data and I'm really aligning that with my best practices of does that make sense? The other side of it is if I can't figure that out, and there are platforms which I won't name, 
But you will see, you can narrow down through a number of different analytics. If, an, if a company says they're attributing this much pickups, and you have a discount for that certain uh, deal through that platform, and they don't line up, there's a good way to associate that with maybe understanding that they don't pick up all the orders placed. So it's about evaluating the data and really understanding and reading between the lines of what that means. So you may get a piece of data from a company that says they play, you had this many orders come through this platform. However, by narrowing down and being able to trace and, um, back on your POS system and having a path of that, through that customer journey is really gonna help you really read that full story. And I'd say the particular company I'm talking about when we did the data look, it's about 50% drop in what they said versus what was picked up. So essentially, if this is a company like Uber Eats, that means 50% of the customer base is placing orders and not picking that up. A lot easier to do that in the industry we're in right now. I think as we mature, I think that's gonna become a little bit more difficult, especially as you know, regulations uh, le loosen up a little bit. So I think it's important to answer your question in, in full. You can't disregard a program or analytics just because you don't disagree with it if you can find a way to narrow that down and then make your decision from there with the utilization and leverage of all the other platforms you have in your tech stack. Beautiful. Uh, Jack. Hello. Oh, yeah. Uh, Jack, I want to get to packaging uh, right after this thought because I'd love to hear both of their thoughts on this same topic, if you don't mind. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> all right. All right. We can do a four-day class on this in terms of omnichannel, customer journey, platforms, performance marketing, and attribution. So I think the, f the most important thing to say is that a lot of the data that we get in this industry is pretty dirty, and that you can't really trust all of the data that you have, even if it's through your own POS system where you're collecting POS information. But um, you almost have to quilt together, you know, whether it's marketing platforms, or if you're thinking about Weed Maps, iHeartJane, Leafly, um, and to layer on top of that performance marketing and then have that un with the foundation of a, a really good, say, like HubSpot CRM program, so for, for your database marketing, and then really read all of that data, stitch it all together, and have some really smart data people who are going to go into it, who are going to understand what your customer segmentation is, whether you're a brand or you're a retailer, the frequency, your lifetime value, and get straight down to basket level, um, how often are they coming, what are the brands that they're really buying, and I, and, and I think being able to share that information with brands I think is really important, and we don't really do that, you know, uh, retailers don't share information with brands. If brands had understood better who's buying their products and getting that real POS data from retailers, they'll probably have a better job and it'll be much more efficient in terms of targeting, right? Um, so I would say, you know, there is a whole lot of arsenal in ter of tools within the arsenal for, for marketing and marketing innovation, but there are just not a lot of marketers who understand how to stitch it together and use it well. And there's no perfect platform. You have to really stitch it. I'm curious to know, why don't vendors, why don't dispensaries want to share that data back to brands? <laughs> you go first. It's not that we don't want to share. Um, we do. I mean, and that's why I, I think, you know, data is great, but to your point, there's a lot of dirty data, and the brands that we have, we book a lot of brand vendor days, and I think that's a great time for a brand to come in and really engage with customers and the bud tenders and learn who their, who their customers are and who their clients are. You know, data's great, but there's a lot you can see with the naked eye that, that data's not going to show you. So I'm a very big data person. We want to make data-driven decisions, but sometimes it's really difficult because you could get one set of data from one department and another from another. So it's about trying to um, scrub the bad data, and, and that is a challenge. And we work through that cross-departmentally every week you know, to, to find out what's reality. And um, from a brand side, I think the brand vendor days and being in there, that's the best way for a brand to really get educated on you know, who their customers are. And listen, with 20 retail locations, the customer in one store is very different than another. And, you know, if they have multi-products, you know, they sell carts, they sell concentrates, you could have one store that's very heavy concentrate, another one that's heavy carts. So they get to learn that and that, that, that product mix and what the right products are. So when we're buying products, we're allocating it to the right, the right stores, 
at the right price point for the customers and meeting them where they're at. So um, to me, the, the naked eye and just being in the stores and learning, you know, uh, is just as important as the data. So. Have you found that with the transparency or lack of transparency with products like Metric, where everything does need to be tracked, are you yeah. able to <laughs> leverage that data at all to help your quilting? Really don't use a lot of metric data. We use metric for what we have to use metric uh -huh. for. Um, we don't use it for data on products or customers or anything like that, no. I mean, we use it because we have to use it, yep. and it's, the, it's our tracking system, obviously, for taking in orders and shipments and, you know, ordering and, and from processing and pulling it out, yes. Um, but as far as, like, customer-based data, no. Okay. We, we, don't, we don't grab from metric. Gotcha. Yeah. I wanted to add to that as well, as we're thinking about headset or BDSA, you know, three out of ten dollars spent at POS um, across all retailers are actually really captured by this, you know, sort of data reporting type platform. So if you're looking at brand ranking, your velocity, you really need to be pulling the POS data and not just looking at BDSA and, um, and headset because that's not really going to tell you too, too much. And also, there's a way of kind of cheating it, because they're only, going, they're only pulling POS data from a third of all of the retailers. So if you're performing really well in those retailers, you're going to perform really well in BDSA and, and, and headset. So right now, again, because we're so early on in our second inning of this game, um, there, you have to be really choiceful. And uh, a lot of brands can't afford uh, the kind of marketers or the, the data scientists to be able to dig through it and really work in partnership with retailers to be able to do the best. So, you know, uh, Bloom over there, their, their brand that I work with when I was in California, and when we did promotions, we shared a lot of data with them. We even shared with them the first party data for um, consumers that came in as part of that promotion that we had for the promotional period. And we saw what was the velocity of the promo units that went out by store, by location. So we can get to that granular level, but it also depends on the partnership. Perfect. Well, thank you. Um, so we'll downshift a little bit and get back to the uh, front end of all of this, which is in product and cultivation. Um, so I'm curious to hear from you, uh, what innovative technologies uh, in product, in cultivation, have you found to be inspiring or interesting as, uh, as your area of expertise is growing? Um, I think the cultivation um, plant life cycle side and addition of vaporiz vaporizers and, and um, um, extra, uh, products to enjoy uh, different types of extracts, uh, there's been quite a bit of innovation there as our understanding of actually the physiology of the plant and the life cycle of the plant has really grown over the last few years. And we've really been able to apply for lack of a better um, uh, better analogy, a, a very deep food science understanding of the nature, self-life, and, and chemistry of the plant and all of its different form factors. So in terms of packaging and, and cultivation, seeing a lot more products very, very focused and very thoughtfully designed around what we know now to be the physiology of the plant and what we know now to be um, kind of the preferred conditions for the life cycle and custody of the plant, whether that be different types of refrigerated packaging, refrigerated cold, uh, tr uh, transportation. We've seen uh, cold packaging for extracts. Uh, Calia uh, made a lot of uh, headwinds or uh, made a lot of news in California for an actual ice pack that went around the extract container that came uh, came with the package. So we're, we're seeing a lot of very thoughtful design and innovations in terms of something that's really stuck out to me recently, um, something we, we didn't work on but I thought was brilliant, which we had. Um, the canopy surveillance uh, drones that you can set up in your grow rooms. I think those are those are fabulous products in terms of tracking um, the entire canopy in terms of temperature, gas exchange, uh, gas levels, um, humidity levels. Uh, there's really a, a ton of in incredible products that are really you know maybe pre-exist to some extent in, in other agricultural verticals or or other industries, but. Uh, given the new knowledge and the new basis we have for uh, cannabis, we're really able to take advantage and leverage some of these technologies or cross-pollinate them into cannabis. So I think that's, that's really exciting. 
Uh, for you specifically, when it comes to bags and packaging, uh, is there anything that you've found recently to have been either an innovation or foundational understanding just you know, with eight years in the game of, of packaging um, that you found to uh, either be better or is it the same right now in terms of getting the product out of the store and into people's hands and either staying fresher, uh, you know, keeping, keeping the plant, keeping the products at, at its best level before consumption? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think the the goal is always, you know, achieving you know high high end performance that we can get with these, um, you know, exotic virgin resins and, and different additives, and being able to use circular, e economically friendly, you know, environmentally friendly materials with that. And that's that's been a uh, a challenge and a goal in, in packaging for a long time. You look, think about the entire global packaging, you know, category. Everything that you use at your operations, from boxes to vaporizers to flexible packaging to, to labels to jars to, you know, aluminum tins and all those different form factors and everything. You you take all that all, all together, and you've got a trillion dollar global industry that mostly relies on hydrocarbon inputs. So what what can we do to increase circularity in that? I think um, we've seen a tremendous amount of innovation. Quite, quite quite a bit of it around hemp plastics and bioplastics and bioresins, but more than just uh, buzzwords, I, I do th see some really exciting innovation, and I, I see some products and some materials that really do have uh, abilities to to change our world with without dramatically changing our our supply chains and the luxuries that we as people you know enjoy from some of these products. Um, so I think it's a it's a really exciting time, and I think the the next ten years will be just as impactful for material science and a circularity standpoint in packaging as the last hundred. I'd love to ask that. So at C-Cell, understanding sustainability, I mean, we're putting a lot of devices in the ground, right? You know, as, a, as, an, entire, as an entire industry. So last year, we launched our EcoStar, which is a 12-week bio, biodegradable casing. So all you have to do is pull out the battery. You, you throw the EcoStar into your compost. 12 weeks later, you can to pick up that metal stem and dispose that correctly and sensibly. So if you think about the, the full circle effect, you know, I think about the maturation of a plant 12 weeks up and then you've got the EcoStar that's 12 weeks down in terms of being biodegradable. A lot of our devices in our um, hardware, we're really looking at 30% reduction of energy usage and we're also working on a national um, initiative where we're going to be working with retailers and brands for recycling. So these are the ways that we can minimize impact. Um, we understand that these are, you know, hardware, um, but there are way and that there's a consumer preference for the convenience of it, but there's ways to be able to be more sensible and better, you know, global citizen. Uh, to double click, uh, well, uh, yeah, we could double click into that for a second. So sustainability, obviously, a really amazing thing that can really help not only uh, the industry, but also the earth. I love that. Uh, I'm curious to know in helping the industry and more to the impact of the client uh, or the consumer, uh, have you found additional innovations in delivering better product to your client through your hardware? Through oh, hardware? Oh. Yeah. Um, Delivering better devices for consumers is the question, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. So we actually allocate 10% of our revenue every year towards R&D, so it's constant innovation. What are we trying to solve for in terms of problems? Like I mentioned in the beginning, the anti-burn, so that it is a better in terms of a safety feature for devices, so you're not overheating them, and, sec and, and also you're not inhaling uh, uh, any particles or oils. Um, and then second part in terms of the flavor preservation because it's not overburning. Uh, you're only heating parts of the oil that it needs to, so you're not like heating that same oil over and over again until you finish that cart. Um, so that's a huge innovation that's going to be launched within weeks. And the second one is in terms of the anti-clogging that we're experiencing a lot. We have this great uh, technology that actually has a vacuum seal, so to speak, type of toggle at the top of the device that um, basically equalizes the air pressure 
each time you each time you use it and then you you can switch it on and then that also is really great for discretion because it won't stink up your car <laughs> so lots of these sites are consumer centric as well as industry leading tech technology we're constantly working on and then there'll be you know a lot more unveiling over a number of weeks if you want to go check out our new tech with the anti-burn and the anti-clogging booth A102, so you can go and talk to the team. Amazing, thank Thanks. you. For you, uh, we actually had a previous conversation and you click, touched on it uh, for a moment, but I'd love to double click into it. You spoke earlier about uh, really tracking trends and understanding what everybody's doing in the market and seeing, uh, you know, where pioneers that are in the industry are coming up with new innovative ways to not only create products but create unique different things to keep things fresh right. i'm curious what are you uh what are you looking at yeah we actually um look at the black market i do we look at the black market and follow those trends like who has their pulse on what's new what's hot now what people want and we bring it here and try to do it in a legal compliant manner um, everything we do is in-house. We're probably 60% vertical now. So it's also about using every single bit of that plant as well, from trim to you know, fresh frozen, whatever, it, make our own distillate. We're completely self-sustained there. But you know, looking at uh, products out of California, black market, what's coming, like it's not here yet, but it's gonna be here. And we wanna be the first ones to meet that customer with the new and exciting product. I mean, you almost have to be to, um, to win. Right. And um, yeah, it's really just looking at the pioneers, to your point, and what they're doing. There's somebody that's starting this like boots on the ground and, you know, maybe they're doing home delivery and it's black market in California. But, you know, here we can do damn near the same thing, maybe sometimes better with the capacity we have, the room we have and the platform we have with 20 retail locations and a wholesale team. So and it gives uh, not just ourselves and our retail, but also for wholesale, everyone in Michigan an opportunity to buy those products and sell them to their customers in Michigan. So we do, we do try to follow trends. Do you think that there's a correlation in uh, black market as well as legacy market where you're seeing innovative thoughts, ideas coming more from the West Coast of these legacy markets that are yeah. definitely in challenging times uh, of trying to stay relevant and trying to survive? I do, I think it is, yeah, for sure. I think it's a combination of both for sure. Um, you know, California is, still and we, we operate in California on a smaller scale but um, yeah the legacy markets I think you know maybe they've done the same things maybe you know in our particular business we haven't really done that we're trying to launch in a bigger you know bigger market and Michigan's one of the bigger markets we have you know we're in five states to Josh's point earlier so um, you know and it's really just up to each area uh, leader as to what they want to bring to market and we do a lot of research to make sure that you know, just because it launches in New Jersey doesn't mean it's the right product here. Or just because we have it in California doesn't mean it's going to speak to our consumers here. So we do a lot of, um, you know, product uh, questions, you know, and uh, surveys with customers to find out what are you looking for and having those conversations. And also really spending time with our marketing department and seeing, you know, how we can, um, you know, advertise this, how we can promote this and find out if it's the right, right product at the right time. Sometimes you have great ideas but you have to wait until the market catches up and we have all kinds of ideas waiting, um, you know, and then just doing things different, different pro, pro, uh, flavor profiles, you know, mm -hmm. different strains and marketing them properly. You know, we, we notice when we launch a new strain, our sales are fantastic. People want newness here. They want something exciting. They want something new, not just in like, you know, a new cart or a new flavor, but people are also wanting new flavor profiles with uh, strains, gummies, a, a little bit of everything. So we're trying to, Again, get them what they want and uh, yeah, follow the trends. Perfect, yeah. thank you. Sure. Back to you. Uh, so uh, with five minutes left, uh, or seven minutes left, um, I would love to just have everybody go down the row and uh, uh, you know, within two minutes, just kind of wrap up with a, either the biggest challenge that you're facing right now or the biggest opportunity that you're seeing uh, in your field of expertise? I think for my seat particularly, it's both a challenge and a big opportunity for us. Um, as we lean in and invest heavily into a lot more digital marketing opportunities that are opening up day after day, it's a risk 
because we don't have the data set to really prove that it works. So we are leaning into um, um, in a direction that we don't really know. We're in a cave without a flashlight. But I think it's also really exciting because the little uh, work we have seen and have done has shown tremendously to benefit us. And so I think that's really exciting for me. But it also keeps me up at night knowing that you know I'm, I'm basically betting on a table where I don't know what numbers I'm playing down. So I think as we mature, I think that's really important. Um, I think another big thing is a constant communication to your leadership and stakeholders on exactly what's going on. Um, a lot of people uh, in any department, in any business I've spent in the last 20 months uh, tend to live in silos. So I think it's important to uh, break those barriers down and be over communicative with your teams to ensure that everybody, um, not only from an operational and strategic, but um, a marketing uh, philosophy are rowing the boat in the same direction. So you have that support top to, uh, top to bottom. And I think that's been the biggest um, success for us this far um, in 2024. Um, in terms of biggest challenge, I think um, it's uh, maybe a challenge, maybe it's a market, market reality. I think for us, we kind of look at the landscape of cannabis, and I think uh, the craft brewery analogy is, is very apt right now. And um, 7,000 or so craft breweries in the United States to do less than 10% of the volume. So I, there's been a tremendous amount of consolidation, as, as I was saying earlier. And, you know, big players dictate a, a very large part of the market in some states, and uh, I think really understanding that and being in tune with that is is critical for us and making sure we're communicating and trying to set the right expectations uh, among our customers because the landscape has shifted very quick, quickly. And I'd say kind of the, the second part of that is, you know, uh, the the conversation for cultivating cannabis has very much changed you know, worldwide from the 1,100 or so cultivation sites have been on six continents from uh, from yield calculations to cost per production calculations. And we've very, very quickly, especially here in Michigan, entered a, a paradigm where we, in some ways, have a very commoditized agricultural market in some re some respects. I um, mean, we have to be very keenly aware of that. And obviously, it does provide tremendous opportunities for us in terms of branding and marketing and differentiating and quality. and curating great flavors, great experiences for our customers, everything else. But that's that's definitely a market condition and a, a market reality that I, I think will uh, continue to be realized, both in Michigan and you know, places like, like Ohio that are still in the, you know, my home state that are still in the, the exuberance of, uh, of REC. Um, in terms of the uh, biggest opportunity, um, we uh, really, it was a, you know, uh, in, in our business being in such a narrow, narrow niche in the, the cultivation and, and quality flower verticals. Uh, it's an explosive time in, in, in global cannabis. Um, it, it's really, uh, you know, a, a thrilling time. And I think a lot of the, the brands and the companies, you know, some of them are on the stage that are differentiating themselves right now and innovating and, and defining their markets, I, I think are going to be a, the global leaders in what is quickly becoming a, a global space. So even, even though I've been doing this for nine years, I still believe there's far more road ahead of me and, you know, for, for this industry than there is behind us. Mm, I'm going to start with opportunities and then challenges later. Um, Opportunity-wise, we haven't really spoken about butt tenders. We've got hundreds of thousands of butt tenders across our legal states, and they're still what I consider to be the, our biggest opportunities, being education first. Um, they're on the front lines. They're hearing about what consumers are asking for. They're also the ones dealing with issues um, and at at the store level. So I think butt tenders are our biggest opportunity and we haven't really quite scratched the surface of how to be able to mobilize them. You know, we, we've got spark plug, we've got all sorts of incentive programs. These are hourly employees that are actually giving um, wellness, health and wellness advice to people who are looking at cannabis plant as, as, a, as, as a wellness alternative and I think they are our biggest opportunity in terms of how we can educate them, how we can make sure that continue to be real advocates and also feeding back the information to us at the sort of office level where we can actually do better. Um, so bud tenders, biggest opportunity. Second, challenges. How do we balance efficiency with race to the bottom? 
across any state. And I think right now, you know, in Michigan, we're really seeing Michigan as such a challenging state because of the price compression. But there's still, we're still all also looking for efficiencies. We're still looking for keep making sure that people are staying in business. So how do we try to mitigate the race to the bottom but still help our customers and the industry look for efficiency? I would say for sure our biggest challenge is right now price compression. Um, you know, to your point, race to the bottom, but also, you know, it's not a limited license state. More licenses are coming out. Um, very little uh, loyalty as far as dispensaries. People shop deals. They shop where they can get what they want. What I'm seeing right now is uh, bigger quantities, lower priced products, and that is a challenge uh, for us. And I think an opportunity is for more cannabis operators to work together and help each other out. That's one thing that I think will help save this state. And, uh, you know, maybe you do solvent list for another brand and you help them out and you know they do something for you or you do collaborative work I think that's where the opportunities are going to lie in the future and I think the strong players that are going to be here in the end are the ones that are going to collaborate and form those really strong partnerships with other operators owners and um, also understand the cannabis culture it's not about corporate weed it's about really understanding the culture of cannabis and, and knowing cannabis so um, I think more operators need to unite and work together 100% I love that it's uh, not looking at this as the prisoner's dilemma, but the uh, cannabis opportunity. So uh, with that, again, everybody, please join me in thanking everybody for joining us today on this panel. And thank you all for coming.